Hello, my name is Jesse Richardson, and I am a policy advisor for Water Systems Council. I'm an attorney and I'm a professor of law at West Virginia University College of Law. Today, I'm going to be talking about interstate water wars. And I'm going to focus on three interstate water wars. Mississippi versus Tennessee, Texas versus New Mexico, and Florida versus Georgia. And I'm going to focus on Florida versus Georgia because it's the latest water war. And uh, I want to give a special welcome to the members of the Georgia Association of Groundwater Professionals who are in Macon, Georgia at their meeting watching this video. All three of these water wars are very important to the groundwater industry. Some of them do not directly relate to groundwater, but the ripple effect will affect groundwater and groundwater professionals. So let's get started. Like I said, we're gonna talk about three different cases. I'm also gonna talk about before I get into the cases themselves, I wanna get into uh, equitable apportionment, which is one way of resolving water conflicts. Interstate compacts, which is another way to resolve these conflicts, and the role of the special master, which is really unique to certain types of United States Supreme Court cases, as we'll see today. Um, Mississippi versus Tennessee is maybe an equitable apportionment case. I'll talk about that. Um, Texas versus New Mexico is litigation over a compact. And finally, Florida versus Georgia is an equitable distribution case. So about 95% of the water in the United States comes from sources that cross state lines or interstate water sources. There are really four different ways that we can resolve any issues between states or to try to allocate water between states in these interstate water issues. The first is the good old fashioned way of litigating the matter in the courts. And in Florida versus Georgia, that has been going on for quite a while. It's rare but Congress can also pass legislation that would allocate the water between the states. And equitable apportionment is a special type of litigation that begins and ends in the United States Supreme Court and divides the water resources between uh, one, two or more states. And finally, interstate compacts, which have been entered into uh, between the states in several instances, and we will talk, be talking about one of those compacts. Actually, we'll talk about another one uh, with Florida versus Georgia, but that's a very unique compact, and I'll mention that as we get there. So unless there's a compact, um, the main way that we divide waters between states is through equitable apportionment. And that is a remedy that has been fashioned by the United States Supreme Court. Since it is litigation between states, the United States Supreme Court has original jurisdiction. That means the litigation is filed in the United States Supreme Court. What the uh, agreed party, the, the party that wishes the court to divide the waters must first do is uh, prove a threatened invasion of rights of serious magnitude. So there has to be a substantial injury first. Um, before That's kind of your ticket to get into the, the United States Supreme Court. 
After that, uh, they must prove that the offending state caused their injury, um, that the injury is redressable. And what that means is that the United States Supreme Court can actually issue an order that will give the complaining party, the complaining state some relief. And that the benefits of dividing the waters between the states outweighs the harm uh, that might result from dividing the waters. And causation is a big issue. Uh, it comes up in a lot of these cases, uh, all of the cases that we're gonna talk about today. Um, it's harder than you think because water, particularly groundwater, as you know, um, it's pretty mysterious how groundwater operates. We can't see it. In addition, there are a lot of intervening causes. There's climate change, uh, there's drought, there's, you know, maybe the state that is injured uh, has mismanaged the waters. So there's just a multitude of other things that can come into play. A lot of our waters, especially in the West, but in the East as well, particularly in, in Georgia, um, are part of federally managed projects like reservoirs and dams. And that raises an issue with respect to causation and whether the court can fashion a remedy that will help the situation. So when the court looks at equitable apportionment, there are several factors that they look at. What are the physical and climatic conditions? Uh, what are the consumptive uses of the water? The character and rate of return flows? Extent of established uses? This seems like a really important factor, and it can really, um, particularly for rural states or for rural areas, that can really hurt them in an equitable apportionment case. Is there storage water available? What is the practical effect of wasteful uses on downstream areas? and damage to upstream areas uh, as compared to the benefits of downstream areas if a limitation is imposed on the upstream users. As you can see from these factors, most of them have been put together in conjunction with surface water. Until the Mississippi versus Tennessee case, every case, uh, of equitable apportionment directly address surface water. Now, as we're going to see, even though the fight is over surface water in most cases, groundwater is implicated. And the results of the case will have profound effects on groundwater in the states in many, if not all of the cases. I talked about a special master and that's something that a lot of my law students actually scratch their head about and say, what is this special master? Well, the United States Supreme Court is usually an appellate court, almost always. They don't examine witnesses, they don't have a jury, they don't take testimony. It is lawyers that argue the law. So the U.S. Supreme Court is usually not in a position to try to find out what the facts are. But that's what they have to do in these water cases. So they appoint a special master. That can be a law professor, and you can bet that I would love to do this. So U.S. Supreme Court justices, if you're watching, I'm available. Um, in more recent years, however, the court has appointed retired judges. And the court doesn't talk about this, but it seems to be a cost issue. Um, and this special master is a neutral, unbiased party. They act kind of like a trial judge and they um, 
hear witnesses, evaluate evidence, and then they make a recommendation to, to the United States Supreme Court. They write a report, make a recommendation. The court doesn't have to follow that recommendation. I would say in the past, they almost always did. In recent years, they have not been quite as deferential to the special master. But the special master performs an essential function in gathering the facts and making a report to the court so that they can hear oral arguments and make a, make an, a ruling. So first, let's talk about uh, Mississippi versus Tennessee. The first time that, you, that the United States Supreme Court has heard a groundwater case, and it's very, very unique, very unique case. Um, so Mississippi um, first brought a lawsuit against Memphis and their public water supplier. Memphis relies almost entirely on groundwater for their public water supply. And they have sunk several wells very close to the Mississippi line. And these wells pump over 200 million gallons a day of water in aggregate. And um, they're developing more wells. And as a result of pumping water in Tennessee, the groundwater levels have dropped in Mississippi. And, and that cone of depression that most of you are familiar with that extends into the state of Mississippi. As I said before though, Mississippi started out by filing in the lower federal court and they did not join Tennessee as a party. They don't want equitable distribution. Instead, they filed a very unique lawsuit that said, uh, Memphis, you're stealing our groundwater and we want you to pay for it. It's not necessarily that we want you to divide up the water between the states, we want you to pay for it. And in that first litigation, uh, the federal court said, hey, we don't have jurisdiction here. Um, it is really uh, has to be filed with the United States Supreme Court and Tennessee has to be a party. And it went up to the United States Supreme Court and Memphis or Mississippi then said, well, we'll amend it and add Tennessee. And the Supreme Court said, no, very abruptly. But then it came back again. Uh, so here's the aquifer uh, that we're talking about. You can see that it borders several states or it's in several states. Um, and it's one big aquifer, according to most sources. But what Mississippi says is, wait a minute, we basically have one confined sub-aquifer that is only in the state of Mississippi. And this is a discrete sub-aquifer. The water is totally in Mississippi and it belongs to Mississippi. Memphis is using modern pumping technology to basically suck the groundwater from beneath the state of Mississippi. And that's not fair. And they should not be able to do that. They charge that it's conversion, which is the, um, a civil law equivalent of theft. You're taking my property and converting it to your own. Uh, they're saying that it's nuisance and they want to be compensated for that. Originally, they asked for 615 million. And of course that is accruing um, over the days as uh, the water is continuously pumped. Um, the other uh, cause of action that they had was trespass, that by taking the water from beneath the state of Mississippi, 
they are trespassing into the state of Mississippi. Um, Mississippi says, Tennessee, you're using this water to your economic advantage, so you should pay for it. And as a matter of fact, Memphis promotes economic development in the state by saying that they have the sweetest, um, best water, and they can get it at the lowest, lowest cost, very low cost compared to other parts of the country. And Mississippi says, well, you're, yeah, that's true, but you're getting it at our expense. So the special master has said, well, this is really not an intrastate aquifer, as Mississippi says, it is really an interstate aquifer. And if uh, Mississippi wishes to recover, equitable apportionment is the answer here. So the special master has recommended that this lawsuit be dismissed or that Mississippi amend it to allege or, or for, to ask for equitable apportionment. Um, Mississippi doesn't seem to be inclined to do that. It looks like this case will eventually be dismissed unless Mississippi ask for equitable apportionment. This is really interesting because Mississippi doesn't want the waters to be divided between the states. They want cash. I can talk about this case for hours and hours, but maybe that'll be a later video. Um, let's talk about Texas versus New Mexico. I'm going to talk about this really briefly. Um, this is under the Rio Grande Compact. So there's an agreement between Texas and New Mexico. And Colorado is involved here, but they're kind of standing on the sidelines. This is really a fight between uh, Texas and New Mexico. And groundwater is really at the heart of this complaint, even though it's about the Rio Grande River. But I'll talk about, you know, why uh, groundwater is really the issue here. So in this case, uh, New Mexico has an obligation to deliver a certain amount of water in the river to Texas. In other words, when the Rio Grande reaches the Texas border, it should have a certain amount of water in it. But it's unusual because under the compact, the water is delivered to the Elephant Butte Reservoir, which is located in southern New Mexico. So it's a little short of the Texas-New Mexico border. And the issue here is whether New Mexico is appropriating for more water between the Elephant Butte Reservoir and the state line. And Texas says they are. And Texas, the claim of Texas centers on about 2,500 new water wells that have been put in very close to the Rio Grande River between the Elephant Butte Reservoir and uh, the Texas state line. And Texas says by putting those water wells in and pumping water, uh, it's caused harm to the Texas water supply, decreasing the allocation and interferes with the operations of the Elephant Butte Reservoir. New Mexico says that's not true. We're not taking more water than we're entitled to. In fact, we are living up to the letter of the compact by delivering precisely the amount of water to precisely the site that we're required to do so, the Elephant Butte Reservoir. If any water is being withdrawn between the reservoir and the state line, 
that's done appropriately under New Mexico law and falls outside the parameters of the, of the compact. Groundwater is state law and the compact shouldn't be interfering with this. And the United States is involved in this uh, litigation and actually about the only thing the court has done so far is allow the United States to intervene in the case and be part of the lawsuit. And New Mexico says, your only interest is protecting surface water. You shouldn't be nosing around on the groundwater. They also have filed counterclaims and said, well, actually, Texas is allowing um, unauthorized depletions. Um, they're using water for irrigation and municipal uses. And a big controversy recently is that in Texas, they are sinking groundwater wells right on the Texas-New Mexico boundary again pumping the groundwater and of course some of that comes from beneath New Mexico and they're using it for hydraulic fracturing. So I can see in the future New Mexico versus Texas that would be uh, really interesting I think for a lawyer at least. So basically New Mexico is saying wait a minute, we have very strict rules for pumping groundwater and surface water. We, you have to get a permit, you're limited to the quantities that you can pump. Whereas over in Texas, the rule in Texas is you can pump as much groundwater as you want. And there's no permitting, no regulation. So New Mexico says it's really on Texas here. This litigation has been dragging on for years and years and years. The only thing that has been accomplished is the United States is now a party and lawyers have been paid a lot of money. It appears as if New Mexico is playing the four corners offense don't know if, if many of you will recognize what I'm saying, but ne Dean Smith at, at UNC, before we had a shot clock in college basketball, when they were ahead, they would often just hold on to the ball as long as they could until the clock ran out. New Mexico appears to know that they're in a losing proposition and they're just kind of running the clock here, it seems like. I anticipate that New Mexico is going to be the loser here. And I know that the people in the New Mexico Groundwater Association are really looking at this and making sure that they're ready for a bad result and what might happen to regulation of groundwater in the state. And now the, the case that has most recently been decided by the court and the case that at least a good, good portion of you are, are more particularly interested in, um, Florida versus Georgia. And this is a battle over the reasonable use of the Apalachicola Chattahoochee Flint uh, River Basin. I hope I pronounced that right. Um, it's a battle over the oyster industry in uh, Florida. It's a battle over who caused the harm, uh, which ended up being a really big issue here. And it's a battle really about whether the court can do anything to help Florida, even if Georgia is at fault here. And it's been a really roller coaster ride for this battle. This particular lawsuit was um, filed in 2013, but really the battle had been going on for at least 20 years prior to that date. 
uh, with various litigation in the federal court. Um, so a big issue here is Atlanta. Atlanta doesn't have much access to groundwater. And so they rely on a series of United States Corps of Engineers dams for most of their uh, water supply. And they use a lot of water, of course. And like I said, about 20 years of litigation over that dam and Atlanta's right to withdraw water from that uh, Corps of Engineers pro project that is intimately connected with the, the river basin here. There's even, there was a big issue um, 20 years ago or more um, involving um, endangered species. The Corps of Engineers was basically holding back water to protect some endangered mussels. Atlanta was running out of water for water supply. They asked the Corps of Engineers for more water and the Corps of Engineers said, sorry, we need to protect these endangered species. And so there was a huge battle over people versus mussels and you know who has the right to this water. In 1997, so over 20 years ago, they entered into a compact, about Alabama, Georgia, and Florida. I'm not going to talk about Alabama much here because Alabama has been standing on the sidelines for most of this. But this compact in 1997 basically was a compact to enter into a compact. So it says, we're going to agree to try to agree. Well, of course, um, they couldn't agree. Um, so in 2003, the, the compact expired. In, um, in 2010, uh, 2012, in that uh, time period, the federal courts issued an opinion that said, Florida, you win. Atlanta, is not entitled to draw water from this dam project. They had to go through a federal statutory procedure. They didn't do it. And therefore, I'm going to say that Atlanta can't have the water, but realizing that this is a big deal, and this is the water that Atlanta relies on. I'm going to stay the, the implementation of my order for two years so that the parties can talk about it and try to reach an agreement. Well, of course, they couldn't reach an agreement. And the two-year period was coming up. And they can make a movie about this. So the twists and turns, right before the two year period was to expire, the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals issued an opinion that said, I'm gonna reverse the lower court and Atlanta can use the water. So now Florida was back to square one, that was 2012. In 2013, they filed this action in the United States Supreme Court to have the court equitably apportion the waters. And the basic allegation by Florida is that Georgia is consuming too much water. And that is taking water away from the basin, increasing the salinity, decreasing water levels, excuse me, and therefore damaging the oyster industry in the state of Florida. Georgia says, hey, 
we're just consuming our fair share. We're not causing any damage. We should not be cut in the amount of water that we use. One big issue in this case at the very beginning was the Army Corps of Engineers controls the flow of this water through the dam system. So even if the United States Supreme Court can divide up the water between Georgia and Florida, is that going to matter? given that the Corps of Engineers has this project there. So the special master went to work and the first report of the special master uh, was very interesting as a lawyer again. Um, the special master said, Indeed, Florida has been substantially injured. They have met that initial hurdle, that ticket to get into the United States Supreme Court. But even if the court addresses this issue, the Corps of Engineers controls the flow and the Corps of Engineers is not a party to this lawsuit, so the special master said the court should dismiss the case because there's nothing that the court can do here. The special master had some scathing language pointed at agricultural water use in Georgia. Um, the amount of water irrigated increased more than tenfold between 1970 and 2014. Um, and these permits don't have limits on um, how much farmers can irrigate. So some very scathing language, but then in the end said, Corps of Engineers is not a party, so the case should be dismissed. Well, I, I, I read the argument in this, and the court was very skeptical. They said, well, wait a minute. The Corps of Engineers is a federal agency. Um, the Corps should be willing to work with us. Um, but there are other issues here. And so the court said, we think the special master was a little harsh. Um, we think they still need to look at, can this be remedied? What is Florida's injury? And what is Georgia's water consumption? So we're going to send it back to the special master. Well, at, at the same time, the special master retired and they appointed a new special master. So that new special master went at getting even more evidence. And in this case, there were just hundreds of thousands of pages of documents, thousands of hours of testimony, just a huge amount of documentary evidence. And the court said, we want more. Uh, so the special master went at it. Well, the special master came back and their recommendation was that Florida's request be denied. Very, very different from the first special master's report. It focused on causation a lot. Um, and it said that Florida um, has proven that their oyster industry has been harmed, but they didn't prove that Georgia caused the harm. And in what seems to be a very much a reversal of the first uh, special master's report. They said Georgia's increased use was not unreasonable or inequitable. And then the special master said, and, and there was a lot of expert testimony in this case, and I'll talk about that shortly. But the special master said, you know, even if, we issue an order. 
that says, Georgia, you have to reduce the amount of water that you can use. The expert testimony shows that the benefit to the oyster industry in Florida would be very, very small, whereas the damages or detriment in Georgia would be huge. So we recommend that you dismiss the case, or, or he recommended that the case be dismissed. So April Fool's Day, um, of 2021, so just recently, it was a very cruel April Fool's joke on uh, Florida because it wasn't a joke, uh, but the court issued its opinion and it said, um, that it, who caused the injury and what the injury exactly is, is not clear here. And Florida had the burden of proof to show that due to Georgia's overconsumption, Florida's oyster fishery, fishery collapsed and these ecological harms occurred. They didn't prove that. Some of the evidence from Georgia had alleged that in fact, Florida mismanaged their oyster industry, uh, allowing um, increased harvesting and not uh, reshell, reshelling uh, some of the oyster um, areas. And Florida's own expert said that there would only be a 1.2% increase in the oyster population if Georgia's consumption was capped. And the court said, that's just not enough. We're gonna ask Georgia to drastically reduce their consumption. It's only gonna benefit Florida a little bit. We just can't justify that. And the other ecological harms of the river basin is really less clear. And the court said, we just don't have enough evidence here. And so they kicked the case out. It was dismissed. Now, you know, what, what's happening now? And I know a lot of the people in Georgia are really concerned about, so what happens now? Well, in the court's opinion, the court was very clear to say, we're dismissing this. But they basically said, they basically pointed their finger at Georgia and said, now Georgia, this doesn't mean that you can pump as much water as you want. You still need to conserve this scarce resource of water. And they also seem to turn to Florida and say, now Florida, if Georgia starts to misbehave and things change and you can show that the actions of Georgia have damaged you, you're welcome to come back and make your case again. So even though it was dismissed, and I know that in Florida, this was a crushing blow to them, that the case was dismissed. But the court left the door open. Now it's going to be a while before Florida can come back and, and go to the well again, so to speak. Is that two years? Is that five years? Is that 10 years? I don't know. But if Florida can gather the evidence that it needs to show that Georgia is causing them harm, we can see a sequel. And this would be really Florida versus Georgia four or something like that. Um, so it can come back again. Um, some of the media in Florida have issued some scathing, um, um, opinions about 
pursuing this lawsuit. Tens of millions, perhaps hundreds of millions of dollars have been spent on this litigation. And at least one news reporter said that money would have been better spent um, on habitat re restoration for the oysters. And at the same time, though, saying that, yes, Alabama, Florida, and Georgia need to get together and resolve these issues. So what does this mean for the groundwater industry, for the water well industry? Well, there's a lot going on here. Even though the only litigation that has focused solely on groundwater is Mississippi versus Tennessee, you can see that Texas versus New Mexico even though it was a surface water issue, they were looking at allegedly uh, groundwater wells that took flow from the Rio Grande. So that was involved there. In Florida versus Georgia, Georgia prevailed. But the court left open the possibility that later, Florida could come back. Uh, will Georgia seek to increase regulation of groundwater and surface water? Or I know that there are some regulations in place already. Will they continue those? And will that limit groundwater extraction and impact the groundwater industry? Um, it's possible. And these water wars are happening more and more. I only talked about three cases. There's actually two others that the United States Supreme Court has recently uh, talked about. And they're important, but I thought that these were the three most important for the groundwater industry. The United States Supreme Court has never been involved in so many water issues before, ever. Um, they're also looking at some Clean Water Act issues that could impact groundwater. So this is a huge issue um, and growing. I see more litigation coming. One thing that is very puzzling in some ways is why haven't more states entered into compacts or agreements that divide up the water. That can theoretically avoid going to the United States Supreme Court. Well, I see several different reasons for that. First, every water battle that I've been involved in, one party, one state, has the water and the other party, the other state wants the water. And if one state is in a strong position, they don't have much of an incentive to settle. They can just name their price. And if the other state doesn't want to go along, then there's the only option is to litigate. Look at Mississippi, for example. If the United States Supreme Court will not take this case, their only option is equitable enforcement. And they will probably not come out very well in an equitable enforcement case. And in that situation, it would mean that Memphis and Tennessee continue to get the water for free and they're back where they started. One thing that was really important in Florida versus Georgia was the battle of the experts. There were a lot of expert witnesses and it appeared just from reading the Supreme Court 
uh, arguments and the special master report and the final opinion that Georgia had better experts and that the Georgia experts were more convincing and that they showed that uh, Georgia had not caused the injury and that there in fact maybe wasn't as much injury. And their experts said it was Florida's fault. It was climate change's fault. It was the fact that we had droughts and they ended up on top. On the other hand, Florida's case was very difficult. They had to prove their case. They have the burden. But the point is that experts are gonna be increasingly important. They've always been important. We're gonna need more and more data and that means more and more money and it's gonna cost a lot of money. So state associations. I know some of you from Georgia are watching this and Georgia is one of my models for what a state association should do. You are proactive, you keep your eyes open, you're constantly looking at what's happening. You need to continue to do that in other states. New Mexico is similar. They're very proactive, they're very engaged. They know what's happening in, in Texas versus New Mexico. They know that if New Mexico loses that case, there might be serious ramifications for the groundwater industry. And so they are preparing themselves. So all the state associations out there keep up with what's happening in the courts, um, in the legislatures, both the state legislature and the federal legislature. Make sure you're one of the parties at the table. This is important. This is your livelihood. And you need to keep up. One thing that, that we have done at Water Systems Council on several occasions is to file friend of court briefs. That's one way that, that we can help and that the groundwater industry can be heard. But even before it gets to that situation, you need to be heard at the local level, at the state level, at the federal level. Make sure that you know what's happening and that you're part of the discussion. In Florida versus Georgia, the question is, what will Florida do next? And I really don't know. Florida has tried everything and so far has been turned back at every turn. Um, I think Florida is going to keep their eye on Georgia and they're going to get more data. They're going to hire more experts and they're going to try to make their case. What's Georgia gonna do? We don't know, but the associations in Florida and Georgia and Texas and New Mexico and Colorado and Mississippi and Tennessee and everywhere need to make sure that they know what the state regulators are doing and that they're involved. I can see Georgia saying we need to have stricter regulations so that this doesn't happen again. I can see states all over saying let's be really careful because we don't want to be sued. Will Florida try to reach an agreement? Will they reach out to Georgia? If they do, will Georgia say leave us alone? We won. The interesting thing about compacts is the court is increasingly litigating cases about compacts. So maybe agreements aren't so great because things change and you reach a compact in 1945 and we're in 2021, things are a lot different. Water is a very dynamic resource. So maybe we need to look at changing the way we do compacts. 
And this is a very exciting time for water lawyers. And this is a very scary time for people in the water industry, whether it be groundwater or surface water. Yogi Berra said, it ain't over till it's over. Well, these water wars are never over. We just switch from the courthouse to the state house to the regulators, um, to lobbying, to the legislature. It, it, it's a constant battle and we need to remain vigilant, remain alert. And the last bullet I have there is that this is all costing a lot of money and it's gonna continue to cost a lot of money. So I'm hopeful that in talking to everyone involved in the water industry, particularly the groundwater industry, that we can put our heads together and say, is there a better way that we can make sure that our households have adequate water supplies and that other uses are met, but, the, uh, but that the resource is conserved. In the groundwater industry, the groundwater is our life and is our vocation. So we must conserve and maintain it, but we have to be able to use it for economic purposes. We need to find that balance. I thank you for listening. <clears throat> I thank you for listening to me today. I want to remind you that um, this was courtesy of Water Systems Council. Um, as the slide says, a lot of good things happen when the water well industry unites. One way that we can do that is by joining Water Systems Council. Water Systems Council works to promote and protect the water well industry all across the nation. Uh, go to watersystemscouncil.org, check it out. I hope to see you in person at a meeting very soon, and I hope you all uh, happiness and good health until we meet again. Thank you.